What if you found out that I had a contagious sickness and I was coughing and hacking in front of you? What if I showed up to church and I was diagnosed with pneumonia and I'm coughing and hacking? Well, I got to be here. What would you probably say to me? Or stay away, right? Stay away. Take some medicine. Go home. Keegan will preach something else, right? You might even come up with this thing. You know, if I just kept doing that all the time and showing up sick, you might just say, hey, I made a banner for you, you know? Stay away. (laughs) Stay away. Now trace your imagination back to the first century. And you as a little child fell down and you, you severely broke one foot and you broke the other leg and there are no hospitals. There, there's no Walgreens, there's no CVS, there's, there, there are no doctors as we experience today. There's no modern medicine. You fell down and for that, from that point in time, now into your 30s, you've been a cripple, you can't walk. Now, maybe somebody else here, think about this. You have a fever raging. It's going on for a month, and, and it won't go away. There, there's no medicine that seems to help. There's no hospital to run to, no urgent care facility, no, no doctor. Maybe you have another crisis. Maybe you have a skin rash, and it's all over these obvious parts of your body, and you've tried all sorts of ointments, and, and there's no modern medicine, there's no hospitals, there's no care, and, and you just, you're, you're, you're constantly sick. There's no end in sight. There's no light at the end of the tunnel that this is going to get better. And you, you end up down in the marketplace and you roll out a little mat as you've been doing for years and years. You throw out your little mat. And it's like you have a sign on your chest that says, stay away. Because there you are with your little basket and a mom walks by with her children. And you hear her whisper, might catch what he has. Stay away from her. We don't know what they've got. A moment later, you you see a religious leader who tells people about God's way. That's what they all think. And he tells a colleague of his, "Don't, don't give him any money. Don't give him any coins, must have been something he did, some sin he must have committed, or maybe his parents, his parents sinned, and, and that's why he's been crippled. That's why she's got this raging fever. That's why they're not well like the rest of us. We're healthy. They're sick. Must have been some sin. Stay away. Stay away. Stay away. You hear it all through the marketplace, and so then you pick up your little mat, and you pull yourself along. You pull yourself along a little more, so you get finally to the, the gates of the outer court of the temple, and, and it's like suddenly a bubble is around you because all the people press away from you. They don't want to be near you. You hear that phrase, stay away, ripple through the crowd. And then when you just get near the gate, suddenly a temple official stops you in your tracks and he says, stay away, stop, no further, you're not going in there. You go over there, lay over there, plop down over there with your mess. Tears start streaming down your face and everybody says, stay away, like a contagious disease you are. 
And it's almost like God has put a sign over you that says, stay away too. You wonder if you'll ever experience love, if you'll ever be healed, if you'll have meal for dinner, if you'll have a meal the next day. You see, God gave Moses a law codified in the Old Testament. You can find it. And there were various rules for people who had skin diseases and other kinds of ailments and process of purification, process of cleansing, and at some point, process of separation. But those rules codified in the law of Moses, they had been twisted and, and, and misapplied and added to by the Pharisees and the legal experts over a long period of time into this mean, cruel existence enforced by the religious leaders over the people. And so there you sit by the temple in pain, constant pain, suffering, stay away, and you wonder. You're rejected by the society, you are alienated from worshiping God, you can't get near to God, it feels like, and you can't get near to God's people or God's house, you just stay away. It's what your mom told you the last time you saw her before she died, stay away. But then on that hot, sunny day out by the temple gate. Your four childhood friends, they, they showed up. They, they knew you before the accident. They knew you before you got sick, and, and they, said, they said, hey, hey, Benjamin, th- there's, there's someone, there's a rabbi up in Capernaum, and, and, and he's saying these amazing, astonishing things, and he's healing people like you. He's healing people. The blind are seeing, demons are fleeing. You you gotta come see. People are eating, they're rejoicing, they're learning. You, you gotta, we, we're gonna take you there. And so your your friends, they, they pick you up, you just mat and all, they just haul you off. All the way up to Capernaum to meet this man named Jesus. Jesus enters the scene. Jesus enters the scene, and, and, and the central character by which God revealed himself in Exodus 34 is that he was a compassionate, gracious God, full of loving kindness, a God who forgives iniquities, a forgiving God. One pastor said, forgiveness is the most godlike action that a human being can take. It's intrinsic to God's character, forgiveness, healing. You have to understand that physical sickness, illness was tied to, at this time, a a spiritual sickness. They understood that this must have been caused by some kind of sin, and they may have been wrong in many, many cases, but you and I know this, that we have a contagion all within ourselves that we're born with, a sin sickness of the heart that separates us from God. Not because God isn't unloving. No, He is. It's because God is holy. And it's because we rebelled against God, and when Adam and Eve rejected God's good will and His word and believed and said the word of Satan, that serpent of old in the garden, sin entered into the world and broke everything, and sickness and death then reigned and still reigns over the world. But when Jesus came on the scene, he was introducing something new. He was actually bringing with him the cusp of the coming kingdom of God. He was inaugurating this kingdom of God. He was saying, it's here. It's within your grasp. Come believe. Come believe this good news. In fact, I am the good news, Jesus would make clear. Good news. And when John the Baptist's followers came to Jesus... He, they came with a question, and they said, you know, we need to know if you are the one. And he said, do you see the blind seeing, the sick healed, the lame walking? This is the fulfillment that Jesus was inaugurating in himself, the reign and rule of God. 
on the scene. And so four friends of this man bring him all the way to this rabbi Jesus. But he had to be wondering this question, can Jesus really have the power and authority to heal my sickness and forgive my sin? And you and I really could wonder too, how do we know that Jesus has the power to heal and the authority to forgive? That's what the story of Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 is all about. It's about Jesus forgiving, the forgiver, the ultimate forgiver. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, if you're not already there. Let's enter the story, and we're going to see the setting, and we're going to see then the, the action that takes place, and then the response to the action. There's two responses. There's the response of the scribes. And this is parallel to Luke chapter 5 as well. The Pharisees and the scribes, they're there. And then there's the response of the people. And of course, then the man then encounters Jesus. And we're going to see these truths that resonate across all time. What happened then, and, and two points, what happened then, and then always, always what is true across all time, and then so what? What difference does this make in your life and mine? Because we all face a contagion of sin sickness. We prove that every day. It's evidential. There's empirical evidence all over my life and yours that we have a sin sickness. Every time we get angry, every time we're filled with pride, every time we're faced with envy or strife or bitterness or gossip or slander coming up, boiling up out of ourselves, we know that we have this contagion. And we face it in the literal, physical realm too. Every time you stub your toe and it hurts, every time you get a fever, every time you sprain or break a bone, every time maybe some of you face even an illness that appears terminal, you face the reality of death. How do we know that Jesus has the power to heal and authority to forgive? So verse 1, when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Now, think back, seven days have passed now since we were in the Gospel of Mark, unless you're in this during the week, which I hope you are, because you're all A-plus students. But think about this. Jesus left Capernaum because the people were crowding all around, crying to get near him. And so he says to his disciples early, early one morning after they hunted him down, he said, let's go someplace else. That's what he said, chapter one. Let's go somewhere else because my mission is the primacy of preaching the gospel. They need to hear the good news of the kingdom. Jesus is full of compassion, ready to heal people, but at the same time, the primary focus of his mission is preaching the gospel. So he goes out into all these other little villages around the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum at this point was probably the largest fishing village around the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus has made it his headquarters because Peter, Andrew, Simon and Andrew, James and John, they lived there and they operate a thriving fishing business. In fact, in modern business terms, they were quite successful. These were not poor fishermen. These were successful fishermen. And, and fish would have been the primary protein eaten throughout the whole region. And so these men are operating this, this, this business, and presumably it's Simon Peter's wife's house. So her family, because we find them in the house of, Simon, of Simon's, Simon's wife and his mother-in-law is there. Jesus healed, him, healed her from a fever. You can see that early in chapter 1. But Jesus is back in Capernaum because time has passed. But it was heard that he was at home. So the word spreads out immediately. He's back. He's back. And many were gathered together. In fact, in Luke chapter 5, it was like they were pressing, pushing, so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. There it is. The primary mission of Jesus was preaching the gospel. They need to hear the word. In the Greek language there, the word there is logon from logos, so the word, the message, the message of good news. When we're exhorted to preach the word, it's karutsan tan logon, herald the message, that is, preach the gospel. 
So Jesus is, is teaching the people, preaching the word, and all of these people are pressing into this home, and it would have been a, a multi-family dwelling called and it would have been an insula, so it would have had an attachment door to the village road, and then you walk in, there would have been a courtyard with a number of rooms around the outside of it, and all these people are in, crammed in the insula, they're crammed inside all the rooms, and they're crammed outside of the door, probably spilling out into the road and into other, everybody wants to be an earshot of what this Rabbi Jesus is teaching. Incredible scene again, but something happens. <laughs> And they came bringing to him a paralytic, a man paralyzed, from what we can tell, probably a quadriplegic, carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. (laughs) Now, you've heard this story probably lots and lots of times, but there's some life in here. So they carry him. Now, there wouldn't have been a stairway inside the house. It would have been a stairway around the back, and they would have climbed up. They, 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 we can't get in there. And, of course, this is a self-focused crowd. There is a self-focused nature to this crowd because you would think that a man being carried, a quadriplegic, they'd kind of say, hey, you know, I, I only stub my toe, I, or I just want to hear his teaching. We'll let you pass. No, they, they see this quadriplegic and they say, no, nope. you know what I mean? Like, we're, you're not getting in because I'm more important. I, I got to hear this or I got I to I get my stuff healed, right? So these men, they go, oh, God, we got to get here. They go around the back, go up the stairs, and I've got a picture for you of when you go into Capernaum and someday maybe I'll be able to get there, but they rebuilt a, a house in the first century style because no one exists anymore as... But this is how it would have been built. You see these logs on the roof, and then there would have been smaller sticks there crossing, and then they would have put mud on top of thatch, and then they would have put tile on top of the mud. So there would have been tile, mud, thatch, sticks, and then a a series of logs. So these guys climb up there, and they rip off the tile, and they start digging you know, I mean, this is a major demolition job. job. It's, it's like, you know, fixer-upper on demo day. I mean, there's a, you know, Chip Gaines is like there with a sledgehammer, just like, yeah, let's go, this is great. So they start tearing, and it's got to be a four by six foot type of hole. They got to lower this guy through their friend. And so they dig this huge hole. They have governed it so correctly that they figured out, okay, Jesus is there there. We can hear his voice through there. Or maybe they're looking through the window, you know. Oh, he's right there. Yeah. So they figure out where they're going to lower him. And in Luke's account of it in chapter 5, it, it says they lowered him right in front of Jesus. So can you imagine? Jesus is there, and he's teaching a lesson, and suddenly there's mud and sticks and all kinds of stuff and tile crashing down on his head. You know, like brrr, dust everywhere. Now, I, I have I preached through some, this, some interesting distractions, but nothing like this. I remember a time when I was pastoring in Grand Rapids, and an ambulance pulled up, sirens on and everything, and I was in the middle of my sermon, and they, they hauled somebody away in a gurney, you know, like I was in the middle, I'm like, lesson's kind of over, folks. Let's pray. You know, I can, Jesus is sort of saying, I can hear him saying, well, uh, we're going to take a pause from the Beatitudes. <laughs> Because they're ripping the roof off. And these, these friends, they, they lower paralyzed man down right in front of Jesus. And it becomes the most powerful sermon up to this point, really. So pick up the story again. They lower him down after this major demolition job. They let down the pallet in which the paralytic was lying. And... Jesus, seeing their faith, verse 5, said to the paralytic, sons, your sins are forgiven. The man's paralyzed. But he says, son, your sins are forgiven because that's the ultimate need. That's the ultimate need. Physical needs are evident, but the spiritual need is ultimate. 
And this man knows, as you and I should all know, we have a sin sickness. He has a sign. Stay away. Can't go in. I'm not allowed. And Jesus says, you know what? And here's another way to translate that beautiful little word, son. It could be translated child. Child, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus sees the face of faith. Faith is of the heart. Faith of the heart in Jesus Christ saves. And Jesus sees the face of faith, and Jesus knows what is going on in every person's heart. In John chapter 2, I want you to turn there actually. Turn to John chapter 2 for a quick moment here. We know that Jesus, God in the flesh, God incarnate deity, in the one inaugurating this kingdom of God, it says this in verse 24, 25 of John chapter 2, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men. He was beholden to no one. He knew, he understood, he knew right into their heart, into their mind, every single person. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, he didn't need anybody to tell him about any particular man or woman for he himself knew what was in a man. He knew, he saw the face of faith he knew and recognized the heart of faith. And he says to this man, your sins are forgiven, which means that the man who for all his life felt separated from God, alienated from God's house, rejected by God's people, could not be listened to by the Pharisees who said, stay away, stay away, stay away. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, which means you're right with God now. You're part of God's family. In fact, child. Don't you love that? Son, son. Jesus called him son. Jesus calls you son. Jesus calls you daughter. When you look upon him with the face of faith. And of course, the religious experts who would have said, you know what? We put a sign on that guy. We put a sign on that guy that said, stay away. They're having a conniption. Look here. In verse 6, but some of the scribes, and we know in Luke chapter 5, there were Pharisees too, and they're already an antithesis to the crowds. There's going to be this divide here. The crowds are excited about Jesus, many of whom for the wrong reason, they want to get food or get, he or get healed, but the scribes and the Pharisees see a threat to their power, a threat to their authority, and everything that Jesus is saying looks very dangerous to their whole system. So the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Wait a minute, it looked like standing room only, but the religious experts suddenly had a chair. They got the comfortable seat in the house, right? Oh, because people would respect their position, but they wouldn't let a quadriplegic in. Whew. Why does this man speak that way? They don't call him teacher, they don't call him master, they don't certainly call him Lord. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, they're right. Only God can declare a sinner righteous. Proverbs 17, 15 talks about that. Only God can declare a sinner forgiven. How can he say that? What does he mean? So immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? He knows what is in the heart of every man. He knew what they were thinking before they even said it aloud. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? He's using a common argument form that was used in, in rabbinics, lesser to greater. You're really concerned about this, okay? Which one is greater? Which one is easier? Now, it would have appeared that actually to say the words, your sins are forgiven, would have been easier to do as a heretic, right? Anybody could say that, but how dare they? Only God can justify a sinner. Only God can declare a sinner forgiven but to heal a man, quadriplegic, a paralytic, what is easier? He wagers, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that the, you may know, 
so that you may know, so that you may know that the Son of Man, whew, they would have recognized that. Jesus' title used for himself 14 times in the Gospel of Luke and 83 times across the Gospels, he called himself the Son of Man. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Everywhere Jesus goes, when they experience Jesus, the people end, they respond, the crowds lead in amazement, praising God because they can. And the people healed, leave praising God because they can, because they're astonished, because they've seen the kingdom of God. God in its inauguration. It's, uh, whew, it just entered right in there. Here's a syllogism, the key idea. I want you to get this. Jesus' power over sickness proves his authority to grant forgiveness. That's what this whole text is about. Jesus' power over physical sickness proves his authority to grant forgiveness. You want to see? Look, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. The man who could not walk gets up immediately and leaves rejoicing. And everybody, all kinds of witnesses, everybody knew this man. It wasn't staged. They knew he was, he was a paralytic. They knew he couldn't walk. They saw what happened. The roof is torn out, and everybody leaves going, except the Pharisees and scribes, I might add, though. Everybody else, the crowds leave rejoicing. Jesus' power over sickness proves his authority to grant forgiveness for you. Maybe you doubt that God can forgive you for what you've done. Maybe you've been attending this church for a long time, but there's a shadowy, dark closet in the back of your life with the door still shut. And nobody else knows about it. God knows. God knows what's on your heart. And he's inviting you to look with the face of faith and be forgiven and then don't miss this. Here's the next part in the syllogism, okay? If Jesus' power over sickness grants, uh, proves his authority to grant forgiveness, then Jesus' authority to grant forgiveness proves his divine sonship. This is important. When Jesus said, son of man, he would have brought out this amazing phrase from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So Daniel, remember an overseer, long, long, many years before under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, he said this, he saw this vision. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and people of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. When Jesus used that title for himself, Son of Man, he was demonstrating that he's both Son of Man, Son of God, fully God, fully man, God incarnate, deity, the God-man who moved into our neighborhood, God the flesh, dwelt among us. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this changes everything because it means that Jesus Christ, He is the one who will receive the kingdom from the Father, and He is the one who will fulfill the destiny of humanity while at the same time being deity. Are you tracking? There's Lizzie there. His divine sonship is essential because if He's not the Son of Man and Son of God, then we're not saved, <laughs> and we're not part of God's family, and we are, our sins can't be forgiven, and we can't be called God's children. Oh, but he is, because Jesus' power over sickness proves his authority to grant forgiveness, and Jesus' authority to grant forgiveness proves his divine sonship. See, there is only Jesus meets the ultimate need. Only Jesus meets the ultimate need, which is spiritual restoration 
internal renovation of your heart. Do you need that today? Jeremiah 31, 33, you've got to see this. And if this is a little different for you to flip through the Bible, that's all right. We will bear with you. Isaiah, Jeremiah 31, 33, this is of the new covenant because it is in Christ's blood, which all of this is foreshadowing what we see here. The new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 33, it says this, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Even the paralytic, even the leper, the blind, even the one out of whom the demons flee, they can be called the child of God. You and me. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. Oh, hallelujah. I will remember no more. That means every dark, shadowy spot in that closet, every skeleton you hide under your bed, you look with Jesus, toward Jesus with a face of faith, and he says, what sin? It is as far away as the east is from the west. So far have I removed transgressions from you. Is that good news to you this morning? Because you know what? We all are the paralytic. We're all the one with a contagion or a sickness that we can't heal ourselves, that we cannot get to God, but God came to us to heal us, to restore us, to say, your sins are forgiven, your faith has made you whole. And it's the one in whom we put our object of faith that forgives us of our sin. It's not the faith that we conjure up in ourselves, it's the object of our faith who saves and sanctifies and sets us free. Only Jesus meets the ultimate need. So what difference does this make in your life and mine? We're caring for others. Their physical need that's evident, Jesus has called us on this mission. If you're saved, if you're in Jesus Christ, you're called to care for others. That's the compassion component of this, to care for the physical needs that are evident, but to reach the spiritual need that is ultimate. Don't miss that. Jesus was all about the logos. He is the word, the logos, the word made flesh, and to preach and herald the good news. Jesus is the good news. So now we in Jesus Christ are called to herald him. Say, do you know Jesus? All I have is Christ. You got to get to know him so you can be forgiven of your sins. The caring for the physical needs that are evident reaching the spiritual need that is ultimate. So the difference this makes in you and me, here's the, here's the application. Deliver the mercy of Jesus. Jesus, in his inner being, was full of compassion, mercy to their physical needs. This is love the people, all the people, not just some of the people, not the people that just look like you or speak like you or have similar economic status like you. No, no, all the people. Jesus loved all the people, so God's people in Christ are called to love all the people. Deliver the mercy of Jesus to be moved with his compassion by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is why in a moment we're going to receive our benevolent offering. That is, this goes to the mercy ministry of our church. The flock here that have physical needs, but also people in our community that we help. Some of it also goes to the Flushing Christian Outreach Center in our Thrive Building next door as they give people food and clothing, which I saw them do in a beautiful way for somebody in our community just this past week. Jesus has commissioned us for that by his compassion. And then app number two, bring the message of Jesus to their spiritual need. That's what he's commissioned us for, preach the word. All of us are called to bring out the evangel, the good news, because we can't help but not tell people about it. We've got to tell people about how good he is. And as the forgiven people, we're then free to forgive others as well. We're, we're, as, the, as the forgiven people, as the healed people, we're empowered to show the mercy of Christ. And as the people who have been 
given the message of Jesus and been healed from spiritual sin sickness and our, our need is gone because our needs are all met in Jesus, then we're commissioned to preach this word to everybody, no matter what age or stage or place of life. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? Think about the good news of this story, that the power over sickness that Jesus has is the one, is, proves that he has the authority to grant forgiveness, only him. Think about this. Uh, Tim Keller said, the gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. If you don't believe that, believe it more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. There may be some of you here this morning, you know that you are flawed, that you are sinful, that you have a sin sickness deep within your heart, and Jesus is reaching out to you as the gospel in the flesh. And he is saying, I love you. I know everything about you. And I still love you. And I invite you to be welcomed into the beloved, into the family of God. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, receive that gift of life with him. Do it now. God is inviting you to do it now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Have your sins forgiven, life forevermore with him. And for all who are saved, this is what Jesus is calling us to do, to deliver the mercy of Jesus and bring the message of Jesus to a world pulling along on the ground on their mat, looking for hope, feeling lost, desperate. We stay away, they hear. We go to them. We go to them with the gospel of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, I praise you for your mercy and kindness. We thank you for giving us this story that shows us your son's power and authority over sickness and over sin. And we pray, oh God, that we'd be faithful to live out this life mission you've called us to as your people. Oh, to your glory, may you be the one we live for, not ourselves. May you receive all glory and honor, majesty and dominion, both now and forevermore. And as we give to the Benevolence Fund right now, we pray that we do it with generous hearts because you have poured out your generous grace on us to the praise of your glorious grace. And all those forgiven in Jesus shout, 